Welcome to Trunkle Jet. I'm Jet Garrison, and I am chatting with queer and trans creatives that I admire and appreciate. And today, I am talking to Gretchen Wilder, who, along with being a musical theater and comedic genius, also not hard on the eyes, she is a talented songbird and storyteller who created and stars in the award-winning digital series, These Thems. Gretchen, welcome to Trunkle Jet. Aw, thanks for having me, Trunkle. <laughs> Aww. And for our and for our limited audience who does not know you yet, your pronouns and where you fall on the uh, queer landscape. Well, that's a fun one. Um, my pronouns right now are she, her. Um, but yeah, where I fall in the queer landscape right now <laughs> is um, I identify as a, as a queer femme. Yeah. Now you keep saying right now, um, which I love because right, our, our, our evolution and our gender journey is constantly evolving in my mind for a lot of the folks in my community. When, can you talk about when you came into your queerness and when you started to identify as a queer femme and maybe where you were before that? Yeah, because those are two different timelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, uh, well, if y'all will, if anyone has seen episode one of these thems, um, <laughs> it was loosely inspired off a true story. But um, I was much younger than my character in the show, though. I was, I believe, 20, 19 or 20. And um, yeah, I, I really had originally I grew up very Christian and was taught that homosexuality is a sin. And I, um, so I really think I repressed a lot back then. Um, also there were no cute butches in my, um, high school growing up to have crushes on and I, you know, or in the media. So, um, yeah, I didn't really realize I was queer until I was in college and uh, I had had my first um, cis boyfriend and we started being sexual with each other and I really didn't like it. And um, I was physically, I, I would physically get nauseous often during sex. And I was just like, my body was like, no, 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 no. And so I went to um, the doctor, the guy now, and next thing you know, um, I'm gay. Next thing, next thing. You know. <laughs> so, so there, there is a version of this, a uh, heightened, uh, but uh, a, a, a perhaps autobiographical account of this in episode one of these thems, which I had the pleasure uh, of directing and and going through with you. And I got to tell you, those scenes <laughs> of you in the gyno office with Doctor Butcher were so fun to shoot. <laughs> our first date too we dove right in we dove right in <laughs> as you do sometimes you like to ramp into scenes like that but because of our schedule we had to just dive right in and we'll talk a bit more about these things but I love that you know they say write what you know but also write about the world that you know for for yourself what does the word queer mean for and to you um the word queer to me has always felt like a nice big happy rainbow umbrella. So it feels like, okay, you can identify as queer and not have to box yourself in too much. Um, there's still room for exploration there. There's still room for um, unity. And um, I just feel like it's such a beautiful term because anyone in the community can identify as queer. Um, so yeah. I have Maybe a weird question for you, because I didn't, I, I sent you some kind of broad strokes on what we would talk about, but because of who you are too, and because of so many queer, maybe femme of centric folk in my life that are witchy queers, why are there so many witchy queers? And not just femme of centric folks, like there, what, what is your take on that? Um, well, I guess my question back would be why are there so many queerish witches? <laughs> I don't know. I honestly, I think queerness and, um, well, 
first of all, like witchcraft in general, or however you want to label it, is very much going against the system. It's very anti-patriarchy. It's goddess worship. It's nature magic. And so I think queer people, I also believe all queer people are magical anyway. And also, like when you label yourself a witch, it's all about empowering yourself, a lot of divine feminine vibes, and also um, being able to transform, transform energy, um, manifest things, uh, you know, say, you know, fuck you to um, anything that is trying to put you in a box or prevent you from living your truest your fullest life and your truest self. And so I feel like queers are doing that. Queers are the ultimate magicians, I think. Mm. I mean, we are able to take, you know, see ourselves in the future, how we feel like we should be expressing ourselves or, you know, moving through the world. And we truly transform into um, our fullest self. So by default, I think all queer people are, are magical witches. <laughs> I so appreciate that answer. And I know I just threw that at you, but I was like, I have to ask her because, you know, <laughs> you, you read tarot and, and you, you have such um, an affinity and a collection and, and gift giving of the crystals and stones in your life and in your community. And um, so I, I do appreciate that about you. I don't always understand it, but I'm learning more and more because I have to pay attention to so much of, of my community that is tapped into that much better than I am. And I've had folks call me out and they're like, Jed, I don't know if you're realizing this, but you're manifesting some of this and how I'm positioning some of, of how I approach some of my own creativity and work. So I do um, feel that, but I was so curious about that connection to queerness. And I love how you just explained that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> now, go, going back to these thems because um that is how we grew to to know and work together and i and i express this between you me and sophia we really became a triad of parents to to get these thems to screen and help this baby this project of yours that you had spent you know a couple of years developing writing getting to the place of you know uh, getting it onto the screen right um and then building this amazing queer chosen family to get it to screen and now we're almost two years after shooting it right um my question to you and you know if folks haven't seen these thems they need to go watch it to really appreciate and understand um the the story and the characters that you created and the world that you created i'm curious for you um what maybe did you learn or how did you grow in your own connection to queer community through the process of making these thems? Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like, so as we all know, sexuality is different than gender expression or gender identity. And I feel like both of my, my journey has evolved in both lanes through the making of these thems really. Um, and surrounding myself with brilliant queer creatives like you, for example. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, when I, when I wanted to write these thems, it was because I hadn't ever seen me or my journey on screen. And even as a white woman, still had never seen a white woman, a white feminine presenting woman having a like romance with a mask of center person or a non-binary person, right? And that was just so, that was just my lived experience. And um, so, yeah, I think like, I also didn't identify as a queer femme when I first started writing the show. I, I still identified as like strictly a lesbian, right? Capital and, or, L. A dyke, or a yeah. dyke. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think like also that's language shifting, language is always changing. And so I was like, ooh, this little moniker I identify with a little more. But I think what's so great about this show is that there is, it has this sense of freedom. So like I still, identify as a lesbian or a dyke and a queer femme. And like, I think there's, you don't have to pick one. 
Like you can have many different um, raincoats underneath your umbrella of queerness. <laughs> nice. I see what you did there. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, it's interesting, like with the idea of gender expression too, and even like something I'm experiencing during COVID that I've talked with some other femmes about, about how like, if we're not having to present our, if we're not having to show up and practice our femininity, how much, you know, how closely tied am I to my like cis female identity? Mm -hmm. And kind of like, I'm starting to tap my foot a little bit in the idea of, um, yeah, just like if, if I'm not performing gender for anyone, what is gender? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, even at the beginning of this, when you asked me my pronouns, I was like, okay, today, you know, it's she, her, I'm feeling very feminine. I'm um, an Airbnb with someone that I'm dating right now. And so I'm like feeling that energy, but I recently changed my profile, my pronouns to she, they, just to see how it would feel. Just to be like, I'm not really super active on Instagram right now. So the only people who are seeing my profile are, I don't know, trying to stop me anyway. But <laughs> just to see like how that feels. And mm -hmm. it is interesting. I noticed like, I've noticed when people have just defaulted and used they pronouns for me, it like, I'm like, oh, what's this feeling? Huh? Interesting. Okay. Um, what is gender? Um, is I think gender is actually just all made up. So, <laughs> you know. Well, there um, is, the, yeah, right. The statement gender is a construct. And going back to what you were saying earlier of sexuality being a, you know, fl fluid, right? And being a spectrum. Uh, for me, since the beginning, gender has been a, a spectrum and fluid. And I think that, you know, this allowance for us um, to be able to lean into that and figure out how we feel. I wanted you to talk a little bit more about this notion of performance, right? And performing our gender, the difference between performing our gender for ourself and how we want to present how we feel versus what that's like when we're presenting uh, for someone else. Because you, you mentioned that, right? And and also this the, the performer in you, right? As a creative, because there is fun in that. But when does it feel um, projected, right? When do we feel like we are, we have to do that? Um, how do you think about, about that as far as we, when we put on our different, uh, you know, suits, if you will? Yeah. Well, one of my favorite things to say, which I haven't said to anyone in a while, because we're living in these weird times is, um, gender is a performance. I'm just really good at playing a woman. <laughs> <laughs> just really good at it. Um, <laughs> It's interesting. It's like any certain days I feel like my best self when I'm, I feel like sexiest when I'm super femme, really high femme. I know that's not the case for everybody. Right. And so, um, I think there's like a matter of performing it for myself to feel good and hot, but there's also some times where I kind of resent that side of myself. And so when it comes to like performing that side of gender on a day to day, it's interesting. Like I'm kind of grappling with the idea of like, why, why do I resent so much that I'm taken more seriously if I have a red lip on and my hair mm. done and like a figure flattering outfit? Why am I considered more valuable then? Right. Um, when you're in your power femme suit. Yeah. Yeah. Versus the idea of like, you know, um, I certainly don't identify as butch, but <laughs> I'm really bad at playing butch, but, um, even when I'm trying to like kind of pass under the radar and perform, perform my gender as more non-binary as more like, you know, no makeup hair tied back or in a hat, like loose clothing, jacket, whatever it, Mm, I don't know. I feel like there's, there's always going to be people like judging you, but I, I don't know. It's just, it's an interesting experience to like feel, um, feel how different people perceive, uh, perceive that and like trying not to care so much about it. And also, I don't know. I think 
I'm trying to find power more in um, being myself, however I feel on that day, as opposed Mm to feeling like I have to show up the way people expect me to show up. Um, I think that's what you're hitting on right there is this conditioning that we have had from a very early age in this patriarchal construct of what that feminine and masculine is supposed to look like. And why is it not still considered presenting as femme or feminine if you don't want to wear makeup or if you want to have your hair, you know, back like that is this thing that we carry this damage that we're taught from an early age. Yeah. And you know what? It's pervasive in the queer community too. Mm -hmm. Even though we say the patriarchy, it's still, you know, I, um, I have been in several relationships at this point in my life and I was in a relationship a while ago, but I remember that was very butch femme dynamic, very, very butch femme dynamic. And I remember when I wouldn't perform femininity for my partner that they would comment on it and wouldn't Mm -hmm. like it. And, um, it's just, and then it's interesting to think like, well, there are people who are very, very feminine all the time and there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't know, it's just interesting to think like, um, exactly what you were saying. And also the idea of like how much those, um, that dynamic has truly been ingrained into us to, even yeah. in the community where we're trying to move against it. Right. Which is why we have these conversations, why we should be having these conversations and ask ourselves, huh, when I'm uh, going to leave the house and I choose to, to wear whatever I'm going to wear, am I doing that because this is how I feel sexy or empowered or comfortable or whatever it is? Or is this because I feel like this is what is expected of me? And I think that, you know, uh, that is something that, We've all been uh, raised in a certain way. I'm so excited now for, for, for the conversations we're having, the language that we're having, the, the way we're talking and thinking about gender, especially in the queer community, but even, even beyond. And I think this goes to, I know you talk a lot about this you know, aspect of edutainment, right, in, in the work that you do. And as a creative, how do some of these, these thematics play into what it is that you want to create. Now, these thems is a perfect example of of all of this going into one show, but it's not the only show you're going to be a part of. It's not the only show you're going to create, you know, after season 10. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But but how does your queerness and and that play into what it is that that you want to create and where you see yourself moving forward as a creative? Um, Well, I mean, it's such an important part of my life. And so, you know, my production company, Wilder Woman Productions, um, the mission statement is an intersectional feminist production company. Um, And I really do, I I don't just want to tell specifically queer stories, but queerness will always be a part of my storytelling. Even on things, on projects that I'm working on right now, um, that are not, uh, are not inherently queer, but there are certainly queer characters in them. Um, and it's always comes from a point of like a perspective of feminism, AKA anti-patriarchy, right. Mm -hmm. And intersectionality. And I know that's like such a buzzword now, but it's, it's true. Like I'm, I don't have interest in making, um, Bridgerton, for example, don't care. Um, so it's this idea of like, even if something, and these thems will 100% be the queerest thing I ever do. Like I, you can't even get queerer. <laughs> so I've really set myself up to like, that's the gayest thing that's possible. Let's continue the. Now, now you gotta go, you gotta go back and slum it with the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and even like, um, I'm working on, uh, I guess I can say this because I've been working hard on it, it, but I'm working on a novel right now. Ooh. And the protagonist is a is a feminist, right? She's a feminist protagonist and she is queer, but her story is very much a huge, like a, a story about her discovering herself and her journey. Like she barely talks about her queerness, but it's such like an ingrained part of her um, that I would hope that any work that I create, you just automatically know, oh, this is going to come from a queer perspective. Yeah. 
It's interesting too, because ultimately I think that's what we, a lot of us uh, that are queer creatives would, would hope we finally get to the point where we just are a part of the world and the story, like we are a part of the existing world, right? We've always been here. Um, it's interesting whenever we put something out like a these thems, and you know, I've done a lot of work that has had more of a queer focus and queer characters. Um, we got to dig in a little bit to, you know, how sometimes it's hard to please and represent everyone on the queer spectrum. And should we even try? Like, you know, a project like These Zims, which had such a variety of folks from the queer umbrella that you were talking about before, but it can't have everybody in it. You know, it, it is a challenge. And do you think it's difficult when as a creative, whether you're speaking for yourself or other folks that you've talked to, when you try to do that, when you try to represent everybody, what are some of the the landmines or pitfalls you can fall into? Yeah, I mean, it's very difficult. You, it's, mm, you, unless you have someone from each of these perspectives heavily involved in the creating process, you're never gonna be able to represent them accurately. And, you know, that's definitely something I even learned. And, you know, as season two is being written right now, as you know, and sh right now, Sean Dasani and um, TL Thompson are co-writing with me uh, for season two. And not only is that super exciting because we, but it's, it's really nice to collaborate first of all, but also we get to really develop these characters in a more full way, right? And yeah, I mean, it's it's very difficult. I definitely, I would say like 97% of the feedback I've gotten about the show has been over, overwhelming positive. Like people love it, connect with it, are super grateful for it. And there's that 3% that really, you know, it didn't come from a loving place <laughs> and it didn't come from a, um, you know, place of like, uh, I see what you're trying to do and here's something that can help make it better. It came from a place like, Hey, fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't know me <laughs> sort of thing. And it, you know, as a creator and as an empath and as a Pisces, it hurts to, experience that especially when I definitely like um did everything in my power to make sure that the right people were involved so that people felt represented but you're never going to be able to please anybody everybody and if you are then you're doing something wrong right like yeah. Yeah. if you're if you if every single person who watches your work agrees with it a hundred percent then that's not art that's um it's a challenge <laughs> it's a challenge absolutely well i don't even know if that i don't even know if that's possible right because you know with right. everything kind of um especially with creativity you know every everybody has a take and an opinion what was there used to be that saying i'd rather people love or hate me than to be indifferent as far as my you know cr creativity because at least you're affecting them and you know, you just mentioned like maybe 97% of your response to the show has been positive and, you know, people still are discovering and reaching out, but that little, you know, one to 3% that stings and it carries with you. Um, and it does like, it almost gets elevated above it. But I, I think there is some good stuff that comes from that, right? Because it makes you think and yeah. it makes you question. It's like, okay, what, you know, what is the intention? And also what is the reception and, and thinking about that reception and the significance of it and, and. I personally, as a creative, never want to create something that's going to harm somebody. So we have to, we have a sense of responsibility and privilege with that. Um, but that notion that there is a monolithic experience for any of these characters. Um, and how, how can we let our characters not always be heroes? How do we let them be messy? Right. Can you yeah, talk a I'm bit not, about that? Yeah. That's not my forte. Like I honestly, sometimes I'm like, maybe I should be in, like children's musical theater playwright <laughs> like I really <laughs> like to see <laughs> I really like to see the best in people I like to see that in my friendships and my relationships and you know 
the people I engage with. I like to see people showing up and being their best version of themselves. And I also am of the mindset of like, I feel like everyone really is doing the best they can. You know, even if there's like a conflict or you're not vibing with someone, I really just try and be like, you know what? We're on our own journey. We're all dealing with our own shit. We're all just showing up and trying to do the best we can every day. And yeah, so I, I really do think that I'm excited. Ooh, like there's this documentary on HBO right now, The Lady in the Dale. Oh, loving it. Loving Zachary's project. It's so great. Yeah. I didn't even and realize that a- he directed it until I was like, oh, directed by, great. Um, well, I've been following that since, since they were in development. And I love this flawed character who happens yeah. to be trans. <laughs> Yeah, totally. And yeah, absolutely. And so I'm excited for that iteration of things where it's like told authentically, first of all, by actual, you know, people who identify that way, not like the other end of the te- the spectrum that Disclosure did such a brilliant job of being like, this is wrong, you know. But yeah, I think there is room absolutely for more human flawed characters. I don't think that's that maybe 10 years from now, I'll be better at telling those stories, but that's certainly not my angle of storytelling. And that's okay. Like there are other people who can dive in deeper. And I think also like one of the benefits of having Sean and TL on this journey moving forward as we are writing is that we are able to like further unpack these stories um, and be like, oh, what does it look like when Asher fucks up? Right. Yeah. You know? um, no, making, making those allowances, you know, I mean, you're not going to be making the, 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 the trans Dexter, but still, <laughs> you know, okay. So I'm, I'm just realizing that we're, we're, we're quickly running out of time, but it's, it's a good stepping point from what you were just talking about with what you've learned going through these thems where you're moving forward on new creative endeavors and in the spirit of Trunkle Jet and some mentorship, what would be your piece of advice? to newer, younger queer creatives who are wanting to tell queer stories, what would you uh, give them as a, as a nugget of advice? I would say focus on mental health. I would say focus on the journey, not the outcome. Mm. Dream big, but release attachment. Mm. And no at your core, if you're putting out work that you are proud of and that elevates in some way, doesn't punch down, elevates, then you are, you are enough. You have done enough. Like, mm, yeah, every, every piece is a stepping stone. It's not going to be the thing right away. Right. It's like, build your castle, build, do the work, um, and take care of yourself and the, and the people who you're representing also. That is so great, Gretchen. I love hearing you say that. Cause I, I know it's been a journey for you, uh, mm-hmm. especially with this show, uh, a monumental feat that you achieved getting it into the universe and it is still being discovered and still touching people. So uh, I am super proud to know you and have watched your, your growth through that process. So, so thank you. And thank Thank you for taking the time. You were such a big part of it. So it was, it was a fun endeavor. It was a challenging, fun endeavor. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to continuing uh, the process and the project. So I'm excited for season two. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and for your novel as well. I can't wait to see that too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. I know you've got uh, things to do. We'll let you get back to that. <laughs> and thank, thank you all for watching as we continue creating work to build visibility with our chosen family and community because feeling seen is an important part of the journey. <laughs>